thank you, Massimo, for this kind introduction, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me back. It's a great pleasure uh, to be with you and among this uh, stellar uh, list of speakers, uh, to which I don't include myself. Um, I'm, I'm very honored to, to follow these distinguished speakers. What I, what I want to address uh, today is a, a theory of legitimacy for the European Union, and I will spend a little bit of time explaining what that is about. Um, but my background is in constitutional law, European Union law, and jurisprudence, philosophy of law. So in the background uh, of what I say is Kelsen, who I think, uh, much as I uh, respect his work and I love reading his work, and going back to, to the pure theory and the general theory of law and state, I think he has uh, led to numerous mistakes and errors about the nature of law and indirectly about the nature of European Union law. So that's something because I, I'm sure there are lots of Kelsenians in the audience and then of course among the speakers. So perhaps we could have a debate about that too. I spent a long time thinking about European Union law and I've come to the conclusion that unless you address that fundamental structure of uh, Kelsenian jurisprudence, you can't really understand uh, our dilemmas and our challenges. And I'll try to convince you of that in, in, my, in my 30 minutes. So that's the sort of subplot of what I have to say. Um, I will basically talk about three theories of legitimacy which appear at points two, three, and four. The first theory is federalism. The second theory is self-government or statism. I changed the name because I, I wanted to give it a fair shot. I don't think many people would, would go for statism if I called it statism, but I call it self-government because I do see value in it, and the value is in self-government. And the third theory is that of a union of peoples, and that's the view I want to defend. I think it's the preferable, the best, the uh, ethically correct position, and hopefully the title of a book I may write uh, if, I, if, I, if I'm done fighting Brexit in the next few months and years. Um, but a union of peoples is the position I will defend, and I will defend it in two ways, by outlining a legal theory for a union of peoples or constitutional theory, and I will sketch very, very briefly an outline of the particular values that the union of peoples pursues or ought to pursue. So my defense of a union of peoples has these two dis dimensions, distinct dimensions. One about law, which I call dualism, and many in the audience recognize my argument against pluralism in the European Union law. But I add that, a series of distinct values of the internationalist state, uh, as I see it, which are not exactly the same values of the state. So at least the values of the international state when it enters into a Congress or Federation with other states, uh, its actions are assessed on the basis of distinct values that apply to the international domain. And they're not exactly the same as what applies in political action for the domestic case. So what is my uh, question about? It is about legitimacy. And many people think about legitimacy as some kind of popularity. The legitimacy of the European Union is reflected in the way people say they support it or not. I think that's too simplistic because support has uh, different dimensions. And um, let me just um, suggest a distinction between three different ways in which we support an institution or the European Union. One is the outcomes. So an institution that has good outcomes for us or for the people we care about, uh, uh, we support. Uh, similarly, an institution that may actually not have very good results for us uh, or those we care about, but we consider it to be just overall. It's maybe something we did, maybe we're unlucky but the institution uh, is just overall in not dealing with our uh, lack of luck. And the third question, that's really puzzling in constitutional theory, is legitimacy. So what is legitimacy about if it's not about justice? The key example, and you know, people use it a lot, is government. Democratic government could be held by someone you strongly disapprove of. So I disapprove of the government of Theresa May. I have no uh, reservation in saying this to this audience. However, I consider that he, she is legitimately elected and she ought to be the prime minister. So here's a paradox. 
I don't support her, and I do support her at the same time. And the only way of understanding this apparent paradox of democracy is to distinguish between the legitimacy, which is an area of justice, which in my view is prior to every other aspect of justice, and the social dimensions, perhaps, of justice, that, uh, uh, where I start to disagree with the decisions policies of this government. So that her policies are unjust. Nevertheless, her position is legitimate and therefore politically just. Now, what is the difference between legitimacy and uh, full justice is a very big question which I can't enter uh, now. But I'll just simply flag this as the question that interests us today. And my question now is whether there is a theory of legitimacy for the European Union, not necessarily a theory of good outcomes or a theory of justice. When it comes to outcomes, it's where most people begin dealing with the crisis. When they think about what's going on, they're saying, well, it's, it's not working out for millions of people. Lucas Tukalis, a friend, uh, a professor of European uh, uh, Union politics in the uh, European politics at the University of Athens, uh, formerly of the uh, LSE in Oxford, has written a book that's been widely read uh, in defense of Europe, where he, he, he does focus on the need for Europe to deliver on outcomes because he says, unlike nation states, it doesn't have any of the other mechanisms of psychological support. So he says, Europe has very few shared myths and symbols and little common identity either to draw from. Uh, therefore, the European project depends on its capacity to deliver. And as long as this remains true, the European project will be fragile and its fragility becomes most obvious in times of crisis. So Lucas Tukali suggests that in the case of a state with the history and the social uh, memories that bring everything together, it can withstand failure of outcomes because there are other things that unite us and bring us together. I think that is absolutely right, but I think he's missing out uh, the dimension of legitimacy that sometimes, even when we don't have the shared myths or stories, or religion, or other elements of, of community binding us, we may still consider that a collective decision uh, is justified, even though it goes against us. So even when outcomes fail, there are many other ways of defending the institution that produced them. Um, so here is, I think, where much of the criticism of the European Union in the British debate is focused. The, criticism I concentrate on here comes from a very distinguished man, Sir Noel Malcolm, who is a historian by trade, but he is one of those people who has been immensely gifted and has written on all sorts of different topics throughout his life, on Hobbes. I think he's written the history of Kosovo as well, and he's a senior research fellow at All Souls, and he has a lot of time on his hands because he doesn't teach. And in 1991, he wrote a very influential essay uh, called Sense on Sovereignty. And, and in the recent uh, Brexit uh, debates and referendum, he wrote for Brexit from a more or less conservative uh, point of view. But he gave, unusually for the most Brexit years, a very uh, thorough and interesting analysis in The Spectator. But I'm now going back to the 1991 piece because he has his constitutional analysis, which is, to me, an attack on the European Union's legitimacy. So the point here is not that the EU fails to solve problems. His argument is that it shouldn't try. These problems must be solved by us, the political community, the democracy, the state. And the way he puts it is by way of a theory of sovereignty, or which will mean, in the end, self-government. Parliamentary sovereignty, our elected representatives must make decisions about our lives. So he has this very, I think, very sharp distinction between sovereignty and power. And he, he says power can, of course, be shared. So the European Union meets and shares power. But there's one thing that you cannot share, that's sovereignty. Because once you lose sovereignty, somebody else has taken it. So he says, so I heard the expression this morning, shared sovereignty. So this is exactly what Noel Malcolm disagrees with. He says, sovereignty means constitutional independence. 
the exercise of plenary and exclusive political authority in a legal order. The idea that constitutional independence can be pooled is therefore an evident absurdity. Why do people believe in this idea or say that they believe in it? So the last sentence is his critique uh, against uh, pro-European advocates who say, well, we now live at a time of post-sovereignty. Remember also around that time, uh, Neil McCormick wrote uh, against sovereign post-sovereignty um, we're in a post-sovereign state. So although he doesn't cite Neil McCormick, I think that's probably in the background. Notice also what he's saying here. This is not a theory of sovereignty that we take from Austin, those of you familiar with, or indeed Carl Schmidt. It's not about a fundamental power, some kind of um, factual omnipotent, omnipotent power that exercise sovereignty in a state. That's not the idea he has in mind. What I think he has in mind is a constitutional ideal. And I think that follows from the fact that he says that sovereignty has these legal features. They're not factual features. Uh, they are, it's, a, it's a plenary and exclusive political authority. By virtue of what? Well, by virtue of some constitutional arrangement. So I think the distinction must be that sovereignty is a matter of our laws. It uh, creates institutions of self-government whereby we make decisions about our future and that, that we cannot share with others. We can share powers, we can delegate powers to shared institutions, but we cannot delegate our fundamental power to decide for ourselves. So for me, it's a theory of legitimacy. It doesn't say that we always decide correctly. It's not part of the argument. And his argument against the European Union, and you see it in other debates, indeed the German, in Germany you've seen the same argument, that the way the European Union speaks about itself violates those distinctions. And from the fact that it exercises shared and delegated powers, it says that it has the ultimate decision-making power over them. And I'll come back to uh, the arguments in German debate in a minute. But that's the, that's the constitutional ideal of legitimacy of the independent state, self-governing state, um, that should not be compromised. So you see, this is, I suppose, something like Mal Noel Malcolm's deduction. If sovereignty is not power, then sovereignty cannot be shared. So if you give up your sovereignty, you're now under the control of someone else and the political community has changed fundamentally. His, his point is integration, as we see it in the European Union, threatens sovereignty and threatens our self-government, and it shouldn't happen. Now, I, I must say that I disagree with that, and I think actually there's a conceptual mistake in the argument in the 1991 article, because from the sharing of powers, it doesn't follow that you lose sovereignty, and I'll, I'll say more about it at the end. The, the idea that because we give more and more powers through treaties, suddenly we lost our sovereignty. Seems to me an absurd uh, and confused. But anyway, I'll come back to, back to the end. But see three responses to this legitimacy qu question. What do we do with self-government and sovereignty? Federalism says, yes, we might as well give it up. That's the, that's the legitimate way forward uh, because we are where we are. We heard earlier from uh, Kirsten Jergis the Danny Roderick point and Hugo Habermas points. I'll come to them again. I'll discuss them very briefly. Statism, on the other hand, or self-government, says, no, 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 like Noel Markham does, sovereignty should remain with the member states. And what the EU does it must be justified in another way. Um, or thirdly, the position I wish to defend is to Keep the distinction, sovereignty and power are indeed different things. Sovereignty is a valuable thing. But I don't think that the union of peoples or the proper conception of the union as an international project threatens sovereignty in the least. So there is no such conflict. So now I start with the federalist position. So I'll discuss the three positions, federalism, self-government, and the union of peoples. And federalism comes in many uh, shapes and forms. Those of you interested in the most, uh, I suppose, direct 
version of it is Guy Verhofstadt's new book about Europe. Uh, he's written it many times, but he's the only one who uh, is courageous enough among uh, politicians to argue consistently for a European nation, st or federal state. Uh, you don't find that uh, in, in very many ways. The, the argument uh, we find, and the argument in, in Habermas, which I have a very long quote um, on the screen for you, is that it's the Eurozone crisis that has made it essential to move to uh, a more or less transnational democracy or federal democracy. It's a slight change to what he used to say in the, in the 90s, uh, although I think it's fully consistent. And I'm, I must say, I was, I was impressed when I, I was very surprised he says it so clearly. He says, there's a political and economic argument that the, mo the monetary union has basically created such interdependence and it has so many destructive effects on the periphery. And here I must pause, <laughs> uh, both as somebody who studies these things very you know, for a long time, but carefully, also as a Greek. So I, I take issue with the description given this morning that the problem of the Eurozone is that we have different attitudes to risk sharing between the North and the South. That, for me, that's not true at all. Because part of the problem of the Greek crisis was the fact that German and French banks and Dutch banks lent recklessly to Greece and other countries at, uh, without respecting market discipline at very, very low interest rates and created really perverse incentives for the governments and indeed for the private sector in Spain and, and Ireland and elsewhere um, to borrow heavily. That was a very rational and profitable decision for them at the time. So there is a failure of, of, of the system. There were risk, risk takers on both sides and to use cultural stereotypes to say the crisis was started in Greece because of their attitudes there uh, is totally unacceptable to me. Uh, I see no truth in it, although I know it's very common in Germany. So let me now go back to the main points I'm trying to make, which is that Habermas thinks that the only way to make the Eurozone um, a uh, optimal currency union is to adopt the solutions that the American currency union has, uh, not only free movement, uh, but also transfers, automatic stabilizers, in terms of unemployment benefit payments in the, in the, in the countries that are hit by asymmetrical shocks. Uh, it's it, the same argument, by the way, made by Danny Roderick. Although Danny Roderick uh, has a much more, uh, I think, sophisticated argument about globalization as a whole and the trilemma that uh, Professor Jerga spoke of uh, just before. Think, Roderick believes is evident in, the European, in European integration. We must choose, he says, uh, uh, two among the three. We cannot have globalization, democracy, and national sovereignty simultaneously. Uh, if European leaders want to maintain democracy, they must make a choice between political union and economic disintegration. Roderick leaves it open that if you want to protect democracy, you might also dismantle the Eurozone. I think it's the second best. The first best is to move ahead with very close integration and the sharing of risks among the members of the Eurozone. But he believes this will create such political integration that you are then at a point where sovereignty basically has moved more or less from the member states to the Union. I must say, I see a lot of uh, value in these arguments, and I don't think they're, I don't want to dismiss them at all. Although I don't think they lead one to a theory of legitimacy of the EU along the lines of federalism. And that is because I take very seriously the other argument of the self, of self government, which points to the opposite direction. And to me, it seems a very, very serious argument. Um, I've selected this quote from uh, uh, the Brexit debates because uh, it comes from an, an author that I respect very highly. He is the author of uh, a book on the history of rights, which I use for my book on rights. Uh, he wrote in 1979. Um, Richard Tuck, uh, he's left Cambridge now, he's, now, he's at Harvard, so he, he, he looks at these debates from a distance from the United States. But he wrote a very uh, influential article in Dissent, in the magazine Dissent, saying, well, look, the European Union is against one side of the political spectrum, against the left. 
because by constitutionalizing free movement and all these uh, more or less neoliberal, a term I don't particularly find enlightening, by the way, but this is, I think, the, the tenor of what, he's, of what Richard Stark says. If you have these old liberalizing, economic liberalizing um, uh, institutions fixed in a treaty, you basically uh, um, rule out uh, any kind of radical left program. Uh, he says that partly to do with the, Euro with the, with the Court of Justice, the, 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 the doctrines of the European Court of Justice. So he says, as the jurisprudence of the EU has developed, it has consistently undermined standard left policies such as state aid to industries and nationalization. I pause, I think that argument is false. State aid, which uh, I occasionally teach and I practice in, has so many exceptions that in my humble opinion, it doesn't stop left-wing policies. There may have been a government trying to implement such policies to test it in England, so we don't know uh, for a fact, but uh, people who know a lot about state aid uh, will disagree with that description of EU law, but I leave that to one side. It's a very common position in the Labour Party, by the way, and it's definitely the position of the leadership of the of the Labour Party at the moment, and that's why it's one of the reasons it's so for you know pushing for Brexit. Uh, so he uh, Tuck, I think, uh, nails it when he says constitutional structure that are largely outside the reach of citizens have in the modern world tended almost invariably to back the kind of radical to, to block the radical policies that the left. Believes. If this was true, that would be a serious criticism of the European Union, because it makes the member states less democratic, because it constitutionalizes one side of the political spectrum and rules out the other. So if true, that would be a, a, a real indictment of the European Union. There are many other arguments, and I'm so delighted that Dieter Grimm is in the audience, because I've read his book on this, and I've learned a lot from it. And I'm going to use some of these uh, expressions that he uses to, to refine the point made by Tuck. Um, there's another um, uh, colleague, David Miller, the philosopher David Miller, who makes similar points. Those of you who know his work um, talks about national identity in Europe, and he says, well, because Europe is fragmented in different communities and states, in a pan-European democracy wouldn't work. So David Miller is very keen to talk about the presuppositions of democracy, um, but uh, let me s stick to the uh, legitimacy and the constitutional law points. And here's the uh, quote from uh, Professor Grimm, Judge Grimm, and it's very close to what Neil, Noel Malcolm said, but obviously there's a lot more in the book and a lot more in the argument here uh, of, of interest to lawyers. Um, sovereignty in the EU lies with the member states since they are the masters of the treaties and hold the competence competence. That's the familiar German view which we find more or less in the Maastricht judgments and mostly in the Lisbon judgment and in subsequent judgments. And that's the difference, he says, between a federal state and other types of federations. The EU does not have the right to self-determination about its existence, similar to the point about sovereignty made by Malcolm. The decision about these matters is in the hands of the member states. They decide by way of concluding a treaty under international law, and that means unanimously. And the argument uh, is that it should stay this way. Because how else could it be? Uh, let me pause briefly to talk about the idea of competence, competence, because here is where Kelsen uh, comes into the debate, I think. I don't understand the concept competence, competence. Let's th think about it in terms of power. Malcolm drew a distinction between sovereignty and power. Let's think about it in terms of power. Do I have a power over my power, the raw brute power that a dictator has and is a real sovereign? No, there's only one first order power in that case. That's the Austinian power, the power that uh, some of the authors on sovereignty have written about, Dicey and Austin, I think, talk about that kind of power. It's only first order. I'm powerful enough, I'm sovereign. There's no power over that. So, it must be something else. Competence means competence or authority. But if my legal power is under the authority of a legal system, then everybody is under that legal system. So nobody has competence, competence. If you're trying to say, if there is an office that gives me certain legal entitlements and powers, then my office is subject to the rule of law and the law and nothing else. So in fact, if you have a constitutional order, nobody has competence, competence, no person. You may say that the whole 
community, the Leviathan, the state as a whole has that, enjoys that, and I think that's the meaning of it. But you wouldn't be looking for any particular institution that has that, not the courts, not parliament, not the prime minister. So competence, competence, I think, is, gives you the sense that there is some kind of hierarchy with the beginning of law somewhere. And I think that's the Kelsenian view of the hierarchy of law, and I think that's the view I wish to attack and criticize, because I don't think law is hierarchical. Um, I think, uh, I don't want to go into the Dworkin debates <laughs> versus Hart, but a much more promising and interesting and true account of law is one that looks at it as a series of judgments, interpretive judgments made in various contexts that are organized and constructed through constitutional law and through abstractions, but they do not have a beginning. There's no factual beginning. And it's pointless to try and find the beginning of law in the EU side or the uh, uh, domestic side. Instead, I think, you need to look at the relations between states and international structures in a different light. And that's where I think the, the self-government view fails to notice. It's too defensive of the state, and it doesn't recognize that the international domain has its own values and its own uh, uh, legitimacy and its own criteria. And that's what I'll try to uh, outline with my view of the union of peoples. The basic uh, idea I want to rely on is the idea of jurisdiction, which I, I think is the distinctive feature of the legal system of a state. And jurisdiction is very much like what we described as sovereignty, is the system of rules that is comprehensive and coercive and covers everything from constitutional law to family law to uh, enforcement and the bailiff that will go into your bedroom and take your television if a debt is enforced against you. So that uh, set of institutions that legal practitioners really understand fully in terms of civil procedure, enforcement, deadlines, the, pra the practicalities are for me what make a legal system true and that's what I call by jurisdiction. International law, by contrast, doesn't have that structure. International law doesn't have bailiffs, it doesn't have police, it doesn't have courts. And it shouldn't have, because it doesn't compete with the legal system of states. If you look at the object, the substance, the nature, I want to say, international law, the law of nations, and domestic law are entirely different things. Why did we ever think otherwise? Because Kelsen told us that law is not a matter of substantive content or moral ideas, but it's a formal hierarchy of rules where at the top you've got the Grundnorm. Hart agreed and said at the top you've got the rule of recognition. So if international law is a legal system and domestic law is a legal system, there has to be a conflict between them about the rule of recognition. If there are two uh, uh, identical things that compete in the same territory, there must be a conflict. Kelsen says the answer is monism. And that's what and, uh, I think uh, supports a lot of the thinking of the European Court of Justice. It's a monist theory that the European Court is giving us. Um, however, if you, uh, well, the, um, the other option, if you don't go with, uh, with monism for Kelsen, you, you may go with the state monism or to say that international is not really law. That's the view taken by Hart. Interestingly, and they're both consistent, but in my view, they're both wrong because the point about international law is that it's a different thing. And that's what dualism tries to explain, that there are different features and different legitimacy criteria for domestic law and international law. They do different jobs. So what are these jobs? And here we need to enter uh, a moral argument, in my view, because there's no other way you can understand what law is. And I've borrowed Kant's argument about law, which uh, he talks about public right. I happen to think it's extremely powerful. Uh, others think it's out of date, and they might want to go with other similar arguments, you know, Myron Rawls or Dworkin or, or Simmons or others. And I don't particularly want to claim that there's only one truth of the matter. But there's a very simple argument in Kant's in the Metaphysics of Morals that we have an ethical duty to treat each other as equals. 
That's the starting point. The only way you can treat each other, we treat each other as equals, is under an institutional structure that gives us rights on the basis of reciprocity. See, it's a very simple argument. And everybody has a natural duty of justice, Kant says, to enter into the civil condition under public right. And if you happen, if you're lucky enough to grow up, to live in a society that has it, you've got to maintain it, even if it's not perfectly just. That's the Kantian theory of legitimacy. And that's the only way we can respect each other as equal citizens. And that's the very broad ethical argument for law and political obligation. Well, something similar, I think, has to apply, and Kant makes it clear in the metaphysics of morals, to the international domain. If we, as equal citizens, have set up a more or less legitimate state, respecting each other as equal citizens, we've got to recognize the flawed but real attempts of other people to do the same. So even if they haven't managed it very well and their state is imperfect, if it meets some basic criteria of legitimacy, we've got to recognize them as states. And we have a duty of jurisdiction to them. So we've got to recognize their passports. We've got to enter into treaties with them, accept them in the community of nations, and create treaties with them under uh, the laws of treaties and public international law. So there is a moral content to public international law that derives from the moral standing of states uh, as ethical um, projects uh, on the basis of equal citizenship. So you see, it's not that the international threatens the national. The international is an extension of the same moral point. And that's why the law of nations has its own theory of legitimacy, just like the uh, jurisdiction of the state law does. And there's no real difference in the theory. So the point I'm making here, uh, and I made it in my self-promotion now article in, in the edited collection, Philosophical of Advantage of EU Law, has also been made by Matthias Kuhn recently, and I don't claim any originality. So how does this argument then work? Uh, and I said it has two dimensions, law and politics or values. What does it tell us about the law? And uh, I think it tells us that the correct way of understanding the relationship of EU law to constitutional law is dualism. You see, if EU law is a, a, a part of the law of nations and it is tasked with doing different jobs under treaties to the um, um, jobs that the state law does, there is properly no conflict. Only if you think about it in Kelsenian terms, you think that the two are in conflict. I'm not saying there is no disagreement or there is no tension between them and difficulties and decisions of different courts. But there is no uh, need to think of this in terms of a conflict. These are two different systems doing different jobs. So just like public international law is a dualist order, it does certain jobs between states, similarly the EU in principle solves these problems on the basis of, of, of agreements. Of course you'll say, but what about direct effect and supremacy? Well, these are all unanimously agreed under the treaties for a purpose. Uh, of the single market and other purpose, environmental protection or labor law or any other uh, uh, objectives and policies that the European Union has. But these are all international commitments. If everybody really understands that, there is no threat to sovereignty in the way that Noel Malcolm sees it. So if you understand the uh, EU as a union of peoples, that illegitimate uh, move from sharing of power to usurpation of sovereignty doesn't occur. It cannot occur. Now, many people will say, hang on a sec, if you say EU law is international law, then it loses most of its power because we all say it's a sui generis legal order with its features. I don't see that at all, precisely because EU law is the result of international action following, respecting those ethical values it is as valuable as the domestic law uh, uh, enacted in pursuit of the same values. So it's not just an addendum. EU law is not just an addendum. It's an expression of the states, of the European democratic states that enter into the European Union, of their standing, of their own ethical position. So I don't see any weakening of the standing of EU law when you say it's international law.
And indeed, uh, the features I would, com I would uh, 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 emphasize are those at, the, at the, th the third paragraph. Remember, EU law doesn't have its own civil service. The EU doesn't have its, it has a very small civil service, the size of, I think, Birmingham City Council. 30,000, uh, the commission is a very small. It doesn't have a local uh, offices of enforcement. It doesn't have civil procedure or its own courts. And the constitution is changed by way of treaty amendments with unanimity. So all these features show that the EU is not a constitutional model. And it doesn't attempt to be that. The treaties does, do not suggest that they are that. And indeed, the, the Kant had something to say about this, interestingly, in the Metaphysics of Morals, where he talks about federations of states, a congress of federation based on voluntary coalition, which, and they're not a federation like the American states, which is based on a constitution. I think that distinction is true of the European Union. Now, what about the values? What does this argument mean? about the content of EU law and its legitimacy and the, the principles by which we should assess it. First of all, I'm afraid it doesn't actually show very well here. I just want to uh, suggest, yeah, I'll do it. Uh, John Rawls, in his letter to Van Paris, and Van Paris, I think, shares with me this view about the Union of Peoples, by the way, uh, where uh, he says, I, I mean, I'll read the, the relevant bit, that the, the large open market, he says, including all of Europe, is the aim of the large banks and the capitalist business class whose main goal is simply larger profit. So he says, the unionist dream is pointless. Why you want union for its own sake? He says, uh, much would be lost if the European Union became a federal union like the United States. So his view of the EU is, again, as a federation of states for their own purposes. Now, what are the values that, if this is not a constitutional state, very, very briefly, because I'm running out of time, I can return that to the question and answer. I want to suggest four values that are, in a way, replacing values that would apply in the domestic case. The first one, by the way, is common, integrity. Uh, the other three, I think, are distinctive for international unions, such as the European Union. Um, the first one, um, integrity, is the basic idea that the law must make sense as an interpretive order with coherence. And that's difficult. Uh, I mean, it's difficult for the uh, domestic state, especially federal states, different courts. In, in the European Union, it's even more difficult because you've got all these different legal systems. Uh, however, uh, integrity is a requirement so that both the national courts and the European Court of Justice should have the same constitutional theory, and I'd suggest that's the theory of dualism. And so from, looked at from both sides, EU law look, has to be coherent. So radical pluralism, I think, is to be rejected. Um, the second value I want to suggest here is accountability. I, don't, I can't go into any detail here, but even the powers of the European Court of Justice, the, law, the rule of law, the remedies, Frankovic, the monitoring that is done by the national courts through direct effect, are aspects of accountability that states have to respect their agreements. Uh, in addition, they're represented in the European Parliament. All these things are similar to the domestic case, but different. Uh, but accountability is a value, and it could be developed in different ways. I suggest a couple on the slide. Citizenship is, for me, another way of talking about the equal standing of ordinary persons in the European Union. I think this is a major achievement of the treaties. And I think it has had a liberating effect for millions of people, including myself, because I'm exercising free movement, having moved you know, 25 years ago to the United Kingdom. Um, and that replaces other, I suppose, analogous civil rights or fundamental rights in the domestic case. But this is a standing we all have as European citizens, not to be discriminated against. And that's a very important value. Finally, I end with perhaps where I started with the Eurozone crisis and what to do with the um, great disparities uh, of power and economic success within the Eurozone. What I've suggested that since the EU is not a state and it shouldn't become a state, distributive justice, which uh, is the ordinary way we think of political communities, doesn't apply. So it'd be too simple to say that the Germans have an, or the rich citizens of the Union have an obligation to compensate the poor like you do in the United States where the unemployed person in Mississippi receives unemployment benefit paid for partly by Connecticut. Uh, 
That I don't think it follows automatically because solidarity doesn't work that way. It has to be mediated by the states. I cannot go into the details of this, but uh, something like justice and reciprocity, uh, and indeed something like corrective justice. So since France and Germany jointly set up the Eurozone, and the Eurozone blew up in our faces, and the crisis countries are suffering more than everybody else, this is not a matter of distributive justice, but of corrective justice, because you harmed us, or we all harmed ourselves, by our own collective actions, by setting up the Eurozone in, in, in such a bad way. So I, I conclude, uh, and um, I don't have a blueprint. What I presented is a general architecture of uh, the moral standing uh, of the European Union. But as I was listening this morning, I think, uh, I think there is a purpose here, but the, the way you understand the purpose of the European Union is not as a set of goal or policy in an in instrumental way, you have to reach an end result, achieving something. But it's an expressive aim. It's about expressive rationality. It's about stating who we are. We are democratic states who respect our international obligations to each other. Thank you very much.